Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Father Joe Farrell. I work in our office for mission and ministry. We're thrilled that uh, you came out. You braved the weather to come out tonight. I'm going to ask you to check your cell phones and things like that. Make sure they're in the off position uh, so that we uh, don't have any uh, unintended interruptions during tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. Tonight's talk um, is part of a series that we've had at Villanova this year. We still have one more <coughs> event as part of it, but it's called the Catholic Imagination in the Arts series. And we've had various uh, performances on campus, speakers uh, addressing issues within the arts uh, that taps into our whole imagination and how our spiritual imagination, part of our Catholic tradition, our Christian tradition, fall into various aspects. Our last uh, event of this series is going to be on April 27th. You'll see some reminders coming out. There's a band, uh, band a, a choir coming in from Northern Ireland, uh, Capella Ciciliano, and they're going to be performing in the St. Thomas of Villanova Church um, during that very last week of classes, that Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the semester, that evening you'll be here. But tonight we have Dr. Greg Garrett with us from Baylor University down in Texas and caught a very early flight this morning to come up and be with us today, so we're, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, just a, a brief introduction for, for uh, Dr. Garrett. For Dr. Garrett, on Baylor's website, it says, an enlightened education, he says, transcends the classroom's traditional boundaries limitless in its potential for application. He describes education as a formative experience. And I also like what he says, that in his classes, they're geared for people who don't think they already know everything. Isn't that great? Hopefully you've come tonight with a, an appreciation for you too, but maybe not knowing everything about you too and, and might learn something new. Dr. Garrett earned his bachelor's degree in English and his master's degree in creative writing from the University of Central Oklahoma. He earned his PhD in English at Oklahoma State University. And in May of 2007, he completed a Master of Divinity at the Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest in Austin. At Baylor, the students are lucky enough to, to take him for various courses in narrative writing, script writing, American literature, and in film. He's uh, an author of various uh, topics and books, The Gospel According to Hollywood, and most recently, uh, We Get to Carry Each Other, The Gospel According to You Too. That came out in 2009. Now, do you have another book that has come out since 2009? A couple, yeah. A couple <laughs> more books. A prolific writer. Uh, without further ado, we welcome you, Dr. Thank Garrett, you. and we thank you for being with us. Thank you. Hey, Villanova. How are you? Good. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me at all, I guess? Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you. I bring greetings from Austin, Texas, which is my home, um, the live music capital of the world. I brought my guitar, as I am required to do by Austin statutes, um, but I am licensed to play. so. Um, don't be frightened. A lot of times when people stand up in front of you and then they pull out a musical instrument and you're like, oh my God, this could be horrifying. Um, but uh, we all go through training, all of us who live in Austin, uh, so that when we can go out we can be ambassadors for the live music capital of the world. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you here tonight. And uh, I've got a very, very short sort of written statement. Uh, and then what I wanted to do was just sort of talk with you. Um, the book that I'm going to be talking from, as Father Joe said, is the, the book called We Get to Carry Each Other, The Gospel According to You Too. And the title that I've given our talk for tonight is The Gospel According to You Too, Rock and Roll and Augustinian Spirituality. That's what, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and there will actually be some Augustinian spirituality. I didn't just throw in a great title. Um, but it is so cool to be a part of this Catholic Imagination in the Arts series. And so I'm grateful to Father Joe, to uh, Christian Osik, to Marcy Bray in their office uh, for bringing me up here. I love talking about U2, and I've talked about U2 all over the world, uh, including in Dublin, where everybody knows more about U2 than you do. Uh, you know, your taxi driver's like, oh, that Tosser Bono. 
I remember him. Um, a little intimidating. So if, if you knew Bono back when he was baby Bono, like we just saw, keep it to yourself, if you would. Um, I discovered the band in the early 1980s, and uh, my first writing job was as a rock journalist. And uh, in the early 1980s, in Oklahoma City, where I lived, uh, every month the magazine that I worked for would uh, parcel out the assignments. And uh, one month they said, okay, there's this band, it's a bunch of like babies from Dublin. Because uh, they were, in those days they were like 18, 19, 20 years old. And I said, I got it. Because <laughs> I was like 18, 19, 20 years old. And I also knew who this band was. Uh, they had had a couple of videos on MTV. Uh, some of you may know that back in the old days, MTV actually played music videos. And uh, their first two albums, uh, that's how most of the people in America knew about them, uh, because uh, they had videos on MTV. And um, so I'm, I'm excited to talk about U2, who I have loved for decades now, and also excited to talk about Augustine. Um, I rediscovered Augustine during my three years as a seminarian and uh, am in the midst of a sort of uh, love affair with Augustine right now. Uh, it's platonic, <laughs> largely. I mean, on my side, I can't. <laughs> but I think what's really fun about this is that uh, those twofold loves in my life can be brought together tonight without, I think, doing violence to either. And in fact, um, actually, they illuminate both of the things that I want to talk about tonight, you two and Augustine. And uh, so I want to start with a couple of very general things. When I was preparing for this talk, I was noticing, uh, of course, the long uh, relationship of Augustinian spirituality and education here at Villanova. And I found some things on the website that really resonated with the talk that I wanted to deliver to you. Um, on the website, the university describes its relationship with Augustine. As you may know, this is, uh, this is what's on the website. Since its founding, Villanova has been privileged to mediate St. Augustine's vision of education as a community activity of scholars searching for truth in open discussion, commitment to ethical values, and dedication to social justice and human rights. I've said on a number of occasions that if Augustine were alive today, I think he would be a U2 fan. Now, I realize that post-mortem decisions about what rock band Augustine would have liked or a little bit like the people talking about the founding fathers or uh, this week and last week the big discussion what would Jesus cut um, but these are the things that we do know that I think would have brought Augustine into U2's camp we know that Augustine was a lover of music and of beauty that he thought of himself and all Christians as pilgrims on an ongoing journey toward God instead of just believers who are settled and set where they are we know that Augustine considered Jesus to be the focus of our Christian spirituality and that he argued repeatedly that the focus of our Christian faith should be what he called the twofold commandment of love. Love for God, love for our neighbors. We're going to recognize all of those Augustinian elements in the lives and music of the band U2. Now, for their part, there is little evidence that Bono, The Edge, Adam Clayton, or Larry Mullen Jr., the four men who have been U2 for the past 30 plus years, think of themselves as steeped in Augustinian spirituality. When I interviewed U2 early in their career, I was not a religious person. I would have had no interest in that question whatsoever. Now, of course, they have no reason to talk to me. Um, I did do a Google search for Bono and Augustine, and really all I found out is that in St. Augustine, Florida, there is a popular barbecue place called Bono's. But I can tell you these things. A couple of years ago, I had a pot of tea with the Anglican priest who serves as U2's chaplain when they're on the road and has been, in fact, a part of their lives for several decades now. He began as a, a rock journalist, like I did. And uh, so I guess maybe I could be the chaplain for U2 at some point down the road. And I was talking with him about an interview that I had uh, seen Bono give, in which it seemed to me that Bono was quoting the contemporary theologian Jürgen Moltmann, one of my favorite theologians. And uh, this chaplain, friend of theirs, said, well, don't think that he wasn't. <laughs> Apparently, Bono has steeped himself in reading theology. And so if anybody in the band is a lover of Augustine, I think probably it would be Bono. We also know that in uh, a song called Mofo, <laughs> off the album Pop, Bono sings several lines that seem to be a, a very Augustinian view of the world about coming toward God in the hopes of filling the God-shaped hole 
inside of the singer. So I don't know anything for sure, but I think that as we look at their lives and their music, those elements of Augustinian thought have been integral to you two, and they've lived those elements out. They've sung them, they've acted them out in their lives. And so those, I think, are the things that we're going to talk about in general tonight. Um, we began with a couple of videos for two reasons. First, if I'm absolute rubbish, you can at least go home and say, well, he was crap, but they did show a couple of videos. <laughs> and we saw two videos. Uh, one of the songs was Magnificent, off the last album, released a couple of years ago, called No Line on the Horizon. And then the other one, the one with Baby Bono. Which one was that? Do you know? Yeah, still haven't found what I'm looking for. We're going to talk about both of those videos at some point, and then I'm going to play a couple of songs uh, so that you can hear the words, and uh, so that we'll have that as some material for us to put in front of us. I love the video for Magnificent, because when you see it, you can't pretend that U2 is not a spiritual band. Um, when my book came out, I did interviews with all sorts of people, uh, with the National Review, with uh, NPR, um, and I remember one morning I was talking to uh, some rock jocks in San Francisco during drive time. And they were just the tiniest bit cynical about the idea that uh, Bono and the uh, other Christian members of U2 bring their faith into their music. Um, and as somebody who was outside of faith for a long time, I understand that impulse. Um, my own experience with most of what we call Christian music is that a lot of it's really abysmal. And so to love a band like you 2 if you're not a Christian, if you don't share their faith commitments, you don't want that to have to be something you have to buy into. I can tell you that because for 20 years I was a U2 fan who didn't like Christians. So I just didn't want to think about them as Christians. But when you look at a video like that magnificent uh, shot in Morocco with those incredible vistas of those uh, cloths, you know, like blowing up into the air, which is, I think, one of the best sort of visual representations of spirit that we're going to see. It's a really powerful way of understanding that um, U2 is and has always been driven by their faith, by their religious commitments. I remember the first of the things that I read about them as I was preparing for my book was uh, something from one of the editors at Rolling Stone who have always loved U2. And uh, this person said that uh, when she was first introduced to U2, she was given two descriptors for them. They were Irish, and they were religious freaks. <laughs> now that, of course, was meant to be derogatory. But what I've come to discover after 30 years of listening to them, after several years of thinking about, reading about, and writing about them, is they are Irish, and they are religious freaks, and that is who they are. That's why they do what they do, it's why they make the music they make, and it's why they live the lives they live. It's not accidental that Bono is the most visible philanthropist in the entire world. It arises out of his religious commitments. So whenever I get questions like I got from these shock jocks in, in San Francisco, um, you know, you, generally they are phrased as something like this, really, are they Christian? Can you name a Christian song? You know, is there a song by you 2 that talks about God? Now, generally, that just sort of reveals people's ignorance. If you like U2 and you know some of their music, you've got a pretty good sense that most of their music is at least in some sense about God. But I finally came up with what I think was a pretty good cynical response to that cynical question. A couple of albums back, I usually tell them, U2 recorded a song called Yahweh. I'm pretty sure that's about God. <laughs> and so that's what we want to talk about tonight. We want to talk about the ways in which the religious imagination of U2 has been informed by their faith. And um, we're going to look at that in three sort of major places. I want to talk about belief, I want to talk about community, and I want to talk about justice. All three of those things are things that we can trace through their work. Um, and belief is fairly easily dealt with, uh, although there are some non-standard things about you 2s faith and practice that are kind of interesting that I want to highlight for you. Uh, we've already identified them as Irish. And those of you that have paid much attention to Ireland over the last 100, 200 years know that religion is an unsettling quality in Ireland in a lot of ways. 
Um, in the memory of many living people in Ireland, people have killed each other because of the variety of Christianity that they espouse. And so Larry Mullen Jr., the drummer uh, for YouTube, early on talked about why the band had moved away from organized religion. Because he said, you know, you had talked to somebody who said, well, I went to Mass on Sunday. And then they went out and killed somebody during the week. And the Protestants were no different. So organized religion in the memory of the members of U2 was a scary thing, a divisive thing. In response to that, in the late 70s and early 80s, they joined a charismatic Christian community in Dublin. Um, if they moved from organized religion, we might call this disorganized religion. Um, it was very loose, uh, what Bono has talked about, uh, this shalom community, as they were called, was that they were religious freaks. They were trying to live out first century Christianity on the streets of Dublin, and they were trying to do it in a way that seemed to them uh, authentic. Now, because it was a charismatic community, the spiritual charisms were very important. Uh, speaking in tongues, prophecy, all of those things that go along with that. And ultimately, the members of the Shalom community had real reservations about the members of U2 continuing to be either in a rock band or in their community. Now, there are people here who, within living memory, have heard rock and roll described as the devil's music. I don't know if you've heard that, anybody? Yeah? Is it? <laughs> Thank you. No way. Um, but the thing that they were thinking about is that often rock and roll celebrates anarchy, it celebrates drugs, it celebrates uh, sex. And so the members of the Shalom community basically were saying, Christians cannot be rock stars. And so right around the time that I interviewed you 2 which was in February of 1982, they had just gone through this whole huge question of whether they could be authentically Christian and pursue their vocation of music. And in fact, it was a very near thing. The Edge, the guitarist and honestly the musical genius of the band, had decided that he was going to stay in the Shalom community and leave you 2 The world would have been a little different, wouldn't it? And here's basically what happened. There are two people that have been associated with you 2 over the years who are not Christian. One of them is Adam Clayton, the the bass player with the blonde hair and glasses that we saw in the videos. Uh, he's going to show up again in several of our stories. In some ways, he's kind of the hero of our story, which is sort of interesting. Um, he's described by many people, of course, as the non-Christian member of U2, and described by other people, particularly the people in the band, as the most Christian member of U2. So Adam had to sit and watch for months while his future was decided. And this is one of the things that The Edge talks about today, about the generosity and patience that Adam displayed with the three Christian members of the band while they were trying to discover whether they could be followers of Christ and play music. The other person, the person who actually saves the day, saves you too for us, is their manager, Paul McGinnis, kind of the fifth beetle, if you will. When The Edge came to Paul McGinnis and said, I've decided to leave the band, Paul McGinnis had already booked the entire tour for their second album. They'd made commitments to their roadies and techs. They'd signed contracts. And uh, Paul McGinnis, may he go down in history for this, turned to the edge and he said, you know, if God had something to say about this tour, he should have told me a long time ago. The edge understood that argument. They had made commitments. They had given their word. They went out on the road together. They played these crazy, hard songs from their second album. And somewhere on the road, maybe the night that they were in Oklahoma City, talking to me. <laughs> Remember, I didn't ask. <laughs> somewhere on that tour, they decided that their vocation was to be followers of Christ who played rock music. And that's made all the difference. That's made all the difference. When we look at the world of music, we find a lot of people who do one thing or the other. 
Not many who do this, both of these things together so faithfully. Now, the upshot of all this, though, growing up in Dublin, seeing Catholics and Protestants at each other's throats, being kicked out of what they thought was a loving and supportive Christian community. Many of you have been burned by a faith community at some time in your life. I have. It's what sent me out the door and into the wilderness. And so for a number of years, what the members of you two who were Christians decided was that they weren't going to have anything to do with the church. They were going to read their Bibles. They were going to follow Jesus in the ways that seemed authentic to them. But they had not seen a group of Jesus followers who had not disappointed them. Now, I do have an update for you, and this again comes from the chaplain. He says, I suspect Bono is going to church a lot more often than he tells anybody. And since I'm here at Villanova, and this will make you happy, I will tell you my suspicion. On a number of occasions in recent years, he has come to the defense of the Catholic Church. And when he has, he has talked about the beauty of the liturgy, of the vestments, of the incense, of the chanting. And I get this very real sense that he's experiencing those things on a fairly regular basis. But along the way, there were all of these decades outside the church. And when we talk about community in a few minutes, that's one of the things that we want to address. One of the things that we think Christians do is that they are part of a faith journey along with other believers. And generally, it's a place that has a steeple. So we're going to have to talk a little bit about that. Now, faith and belief. We've already said that they committed from a very early age to say, we are going to be Christians, we're going to be in this world of rock music, but in a sense, not of it. Um, I used to have, especially in the 90s, when they recorded what seemed to some of my Baylor students very dark albums, and when Bono put on the sunglasses, and uh, when he started saying the F word in public, that kind of freaked out my students. Um, in evangelical culture, there is sort of a stigma against saying the F word in public. Um, and they were also a little concerned about all those shots of them in pubs. And I was like, you do know they're Irish. <laughs> you know, this is not your small town that doesn't have liquor by the drink yet. This is, this is you know, it's a, it's a whole nother world. But we see that their faith and belief shows up in lots of ways. We just watched Magnificent, which is, as I said, a lovely video for what I think is a really lovely song. And if you are looking through the lens of faith, you're going to see things that a secular person is not. When Rolling Stone reviewed No Line on the Horizon, they said that Magnificent was about Bono's love of singing. If you listen closely to these words, and if you haven't heard this song or haven't heard it in a while, I encourage you to go back to it. Bono is picking up a number of words and phrases from the Psalms, his favorite book of the Bible. The second verse talks about how I was born to sing for you. My first cry from the womb, it was a joyful noise. Yeah, it's not about the joy of singing. It's about the joy of singing for God. It's about the joy of expressing the faith that one has. And a lot of u two songs over the past 30 years could also be looked at as prayer or psalms. Now, the most obvious, as some of you know, is a song called 40. Does anyone know why it's called 40? Yeah, exactly. It's the first eight lines or so of Psalm 40 with a little bit of Psalm 6 thrown in. Uh, the part that we find in a couple of U2 songs, how long to sing this song comes from Psalm 6. But Psalm 40 literally is 40. And um, for most of their touring career, and those of you that have seen U2 in concert or seen concert films know this, they have actually used 40 to close their shows. You know, the band gathers, they play these acoustic things, um, and then uh, they play the song, and then one by one they sort of drift off the stage. And if you've been at one of these shows or if you've heard about this, then you know that often the audience will walk out of the stadium singing the song. They will sing how long on the subway as they're walking through the parking lots. It's amazing. So 40 is one of those songs that uh, I think we could think of as, as prayer or psalm. Uh, Yahweh, 
which we mentioned to you earlier and suggested might be about God, uh, I think is very much a contemporary psalm. It's about uh, taking an imperfect person and cleansing that person and, and redeeming that person. Um, magnificent, which we just saw. And then there are another uh, sort of set of songs that uh, display what Augustine used to call jubilation. Um, Augustine wrote a wonderful work on the Psalms, uh, in Ariationes in Salmos. And um, in that work, he talked about one of the things that sort of led me to make this connection. You might remember that in the song Magnificent, there are a couple of places where Bono just says, oh. And he does that in a lot of songs. In fact, some critics have talked about the Bono, oh, which seems to be the thing that happens when you reach the limit of language to communicate. Like words can no longer communicate the joy or the profundity of what I want to say to you. Only these notes, only these sounds. And Augustine wrote in uh, that work uh, on the Psalms, singing to God properly is singing with jubilation. Now what is this singing with jubilation? Think of people singing as they go about some hot and exhausting job. They start celebrating in their happiness with the words of familiar songs but they end up turning away from words and syllables as if they were filled with so much happiness that they couldn't put it into words. And off they go into the noise of jubilation, a sound which means that the heart is giving birth to something it cannot speak of. And who better to receive such jubilation than the ineffable God? Ineffable because you cannot talk about him. And if you cannot talk about him and it is improper just to keep silence, why, what is there left for you to do but jubilate? Isn't that a great word, jubilate? I think we should all do that, like more often than we do, jubilate. In songs like the early uh, U2 songs, Gloria and Rejoice, we find Bono coming up against the limits of his words. Somebody ever heard Gloria off the second album? During the choruses, he breaks into the Latin of the Catholic Church of his youth. Uh, Bono came from sort of Ireland embodied. His father was Catholic, his mother was Protestant. And so he would go to mass with his father and then his father would stand outside while he went to church with his mother. But he said when he got to the chorus, Gloria, only the Latin seemed to communicate. He couldn't find the English words that would be an equivalent for what he wanted to say. And um, so that's one, I think, of several songs where we sort of see you 2 doing this jubilation. Another is the song Rejoice from the same album. And then more recently, there's a song called Elevation, which is a song about transcendence. And um, Bono, in fact, will often chant the word jubilation when he's performing that song. So we get this sense that um, in their music, they know that they are in relation to some supreme being that deserves their praise. And that sometimes the words are not going to be enough to communicate. When we look at their belief, it's really kind of interesting. Um, despite those Baylor students in my office in the 90s, what we discover about the Christian belief of the people in U2 is that it's very orthodox. Uh, they believe in a Trinitarian God. Uh, Bono believes in the traditional uh, Christian understanding of the atonement. Um, and in fact, to the sort of dissatisfaction of secular journalists, Bono talks about Jesus a whole lot more than most of us probably do. So when we look at the way that through their songs and through the things they've had to say about their faith, we discover this Trinitarian idea um, that's at the heart of everything that they believe, um, this very powerful sense of God the Father, uh, a God of beauty, a God of justice that's represented in a lot of their songs, um, not just Yahweh. <laughs> there is also a very, very powerful sense of that Augustinian focus on Jesus as the focus for Christian spirituality. And in fact, in one of the book-length interviews where the interviewer keeps getting upset at Bono for talking about Jesus, this is what I found. Um, this is a lovely and very theological understanding of who and what Jesus is 
in the lives of the followers of Christ. Bono said, my understanding of the scriptures has been made simple by the person of Christ. God, uh, Christ teaches that God is love. What does that mean? What it means for me, a study of the life of Christ. Love here describes itself as a child born in straw poverty, the most vulnerable situation of all. I don't let my religion get too complicated. God is love and allowing myself to be transformed by that love and acting in that love. That's my religion. Now, I should also point out that when Bono talks about Jesus and the Incarnation, he does so in ways that seem very similar to the way that Augustine talks about them in On the Trinity. Maybe another place where Bono's been doing a little side reading. Uh, Bono's idea is that if there is a perfect love, it has to be made manifest. It has to be made incarnate. And that's what Jesus is. I guess it was Augustine's idea before it was Bono's. Spirit is also present in U2's music. And any of you that have ever heard sermons on Trinity Sunday in your home parish or in your church know that generally, as uh, my favorite theologian, Rowan Williams, has said, there is a certain impoverishment in conversation about the Spirit, theological conversation. But there's a very clear sense in U2's music and in their lives that um, there is an understanding of God's Spirit moving in the world. Uh, one of their songs off of Octung Baby is a song called Mysterious Ways. And on a surface level, uh, it seems to be a song about John the Baptist and Salome and that story. Uh, when they performed it on stage in the 90s, they generally did so with a belly dancer. Um, and in fact, that belly dancer later married the Edge, which is just a little bit of side trivia that has nothing to do with Augustine or anything else. Um, but if you listen to the lyrics of Mysterious Ways, you get this sense um, that we find in the Gospel of John uh, about the Spirit blowing where it will. And uh, if you listen to the song closely, you can hear late in the song um, the Edge singing backing vocals and singing, Spirit moves in mysterious ways. So that's one of a number of places. But you know, the, even more interesting to me than the music, and we find a couple of other places where we find references to the Spirit, the process that you two go through when they make an album is a process that they describe as spirit-led. Um, the Edge has talked about how there is no way to account for what happens when the four of them get together in a room. He says the only thing that can account for it is that spirit walks through the room and something beautiful happens. We'll talk more about that process in just a little bit when we talk about community. But um, there's this very powerful sense of all three persons of God in U2's music and, and in their careers. And again, this is kind of an interesting thing. Even a lot of contemporary Christian musicians don't get into Trinitarian thought. You know, if you listen to praise songs, usually an artist will pick a favorite person of the Trinity. You know, kind of like the character in uh, Will Ferrell's movie who, who likes to pray to the baby Jesus. You know, and it's, it's going to be God, I love you, or Jesus, I love you. So I think it's really kind of interesting that these rebels, if you will, uh, who are not a part of mainstream Christian music, on the other hand, are talking about Christianity in really powerful and profound theological ways. Last thing I want to mention to you is this idea of the faith journey that we find in Augustine and that we just saw in the video of Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. That song, for a number of years, has been a sticking point for evangelical Christians. If you believe that once you assent to a certain set of religious facts, you have found what you're looking for, then this song doesn't make any sense to you at all. And it was one of the things, you know, it had been on my student's mind before Bono said the F word. But the idea of the journey which Augustine talks about. And throughout his writing, he talks about in the Confessions, um, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. In other places, he talks about we seek for God continuously. And then when we find him, we continue seeking because our knowledge and perception is always going to be imperfect. Kind of that idea about putting God in a box 
God doesn't stay in our boxes. God breaks out of our boxes. We put him in a new box. For you too, this idea of the faith journey is actually made tangible in that song and in that video. And it's not that they're not assenting to faith statements. I mean, if you listen to that song when Bono sings, I believe in the kingdom come, when all the colors will bleed into one. I mean, that verse is a faith statement. But he says, and yet, and yet. That's why I love this video. And that's why I wanted to show it to you, not just so you could see baby Bono. Um, the very first shot of it, which we didn't quite see, Bono standing in an alley in Las Vegas. I love that they made this video in Las Vegas. And then he starts walking to the rhythm of the rhythm section. And one of the things that I love about U2's music in that is that in almost all great U2 songs, the rhythm section is doing something that sounds either like a heartbeat or like somebody walking. It's like at the very heart of their music, there is this idea of life and journey. So in this video, Bono starts walking down the street, and then the other members of the band start to accompany him, and then people start walking along with them. It's a visual representation of what the Christian members of U2 believe about Christian faith. It's an ongoing journey. It's a journey that we do in company with others. Now, Adam, that we mentioned, if you pay close attention to the video, and I'd encourage you to go back and watch it again, there are times when it's pretty clear from his face that he thinks that this is sort of ridiculous. Now, part of that is they have him lip-syncing the chorus, and although they used to put a microphone in front of Adam for many years on stage, they never turned it on, which probably tells you something. <laughs> so he's a, a non-singer pretending to sing, and he's also a non-Christian. And you may have re remembered from the video that there's a point where Adam actually walks out of the video. <laughs> he crosses the street, he gets in a cab, he raises a beer, waves goodbye. It's like, this is as far as I could go on this journey. But still, that's pretty cool. So, still haven't found what I'm looking for is about that idea that we keep moving, we keep searching, that faith is not a settled point on the map, but an ongoing journey to discover God moving in our lives. Now, I said Adam was going to be one of our heroes, and he is going to. Um, when we talk about community, that's, I think, where I want to go next. And since I brought the guitar at the behest of the Austin City Council, I'm going to go ahead and play a song for you here. Um, this is a song called Pride in the Name of Love, and it's one of the core U2 songs. Uh, if you don't know the song, then all I can really say is shame on you. Um, you know, put down whatever you're doing in the worlds of hip-hop and otherwise, and at least go find this song. Uh, but I'm going to play this song for you because it's going to actually figure into the ongoing story of Adam and his journey that I told you we were going to tell. I'm just going to step out here and sing out, okay? I think you'll be able to hear me fine. Ah. All right, I blame the weather. I did put on new strings for you because I wanted it to be all shiny.
What more in the name of love? In the name of love. What more in the name of love? One man caught up on a barbed wire fence. One man he resists. One man washed up on an empty beach One man betrayed with a kiss In the name of love What more in the name of love In the name of love What more in the name of love Early morning, April 4 Shots ring out in the Memphis sky Free at last, they took your life But they could not take your pride In the name of love What more in the name of love in the name of love One more In the name of love In the name of love What more In the name of love In the name of love Thank you. I know you feel compelled to do that, and yet I welcome it. <laughs> Belief, community, and justice. We're going to talk about those last two things in just a few minutes, because I think we've laid a lot of the groundwork in, in ways that can be really powerful and profound. One of the raps on YouTube, particularly by American Christians, has been this whole idea that they were not part of an organized church. Uh, a couple of years ago, Christianity t t Today, one of the, the largest Christian publications in America, put Bono on the cover uh, to sell more magazines and um, attacked him for what they described as his weak ecclesiology. Now, ecclesiology, as you probably know, is the theological idea that uh, we use when we talk about the church. It comes from ecclesia. Uh, the New Testament term, the Greek term that uh, talks about a gathering of, of believers. And um, so for people like the editor of Christianity Today, Bono couldn't really be living an authentic Christian faith because he wasn't a member of one of those steeple churches we talked about. But the idea that I came to after listening to them and after listening to what they had to say about the way they're living their faith out was that I thought that in a very real way, you too is an ecclesia. It's a gathering of the faithful around a central set of core beliefs. They live those out faithfully together, and that faith walks outside the walls of the ecclesia to play in the world. If you've ever been to a U2 concert, you know that basically what's happening is that they're putting on worship. There is this incredible feeling of transcendence, of connection, of all the things that we imagine happening when steeple church goes right, except it's you and 20,000 other people. That's pretty amazing. And so as I thought more about this idea of you too as a faithful community, it really made more and more sense to me. If we think about what community is supposed to be for us in spiritual practice, community is supposed to love us. 
Community is supposed to challenge us. Community is supposed to keep us accountable. Community is supposed to call us to our highest destinies, to the things that God would have us be. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed clear to me that that's exactly what the members of U2 have done for 30 years. There are a couple of stories that I want to tell you, and they all revolve, strangely enough, around Adam, the non-Christian member. Um, early on in the history of the band, Bono was invited to sing on a famine relief record by Bob Geldof, uh, an Irish rock star. And this was back in the early 80s, and U2 had not really broken through to worldwide prominence in the way that they since have. And there were going to be all of these British pop stars there. Boy George was going to be there. Duran Duran were going to be there. And as strange as this might seem to you, Bono was really intimidated by that. The Edge and Larry Mullen Jr. had other commitments. And so Adam said, I'll go with you. And in fact, if you watch the video for Do They Know It's Christmas, you will again see Adam pretending to sing. Not because he does, but because he knew that his friend needed his support. For him to do the thing that he was called to do, Adam had to be there to help him. And that's lovely, because what we see in these other stories is going to take us on a little journey. When we talk about Adam as the non-Christian one, um, and we get past the things that concerned my evangelical students, I really could care less if Bono says the F word. I think there may be times that you ought to say the F word. There may be situations in life that there's no other real response to. And honestly, if you can't raise a good pint, then what's the point of being Irish? <laughs> so, my own feelings about some of these things are different than, than other folks. But there is no question that when we look at the history of U2, it was Adam Clayton, the bass player, who embraced the rock star lifestyle more than the other members of the band. It was Adam who was engaged to the supermodel. It was Adam that had just the tiniest little substance abuse problem. And it was Adam at that show in Sydney, Australia that they were filming as the record of an entire tour who was so drunk that he not only missed the show but didn't wake up until the next day. Now, I've been in rock bands. And I can tell you that there are certain minimum standards of behavior expected. What would you imagine is one of the things that absolutely has to happen if you're going to be in a rock band? Yeah, you've got to be there. You've got to show up, which is true of any spiritual practice, right? But you've got to be there. And you absolutely have to be there when it is one of those, you know, we've got two shots to get this right. We've got all these camera people here. We're recording. We're preserving the whole tour. The other people were angry, but they were also sad because they knew that as angry as they were, they were not as angry with Adam as Adam was angry with Adam. And it's kind of interesting. In one of Augustine's sermons on Matthew uh, 18, uh, which is the section of the Gospel of Matthew that scholars typically refer to as the discourse on life in the faithful community, Augustine talked about one of the reasons we go to the person who has hurt us privately to bring them back into the community is because their heart, their soul, has been hurt by hurting us. It's totally off of us. It's not, what did you do to me? But what did you do to yourself? And that's exactly what they knew about Adam, that Adam was disappointed in himself, that he was so sorry for what he'd done. And at the same time, as Larry Mullen Jr., the drummer, said, we also all knew that this could not go on. So in love, they said to him, this is going to have to change. They also said, in love, we will be here for you, doing whatever it takes. And what we believe about life in the faithful community is basically this. 
that life allows us to become the people that we're called to be. It's Adam now who is the person that the other members of you two go to when they're suffering through a personal challenge in their lives. Uh, when the edge was getting divorced before he married the belly dancer, it was Adam who was the shoulder that he cried on. And that's why I want to tell you this last story about Adam. It's my favorite U2 story, actually. And while we're going to talk about justice, this is going to head us in that direction. Some of you recall that in living memory, we did not have a Martin Luther King national holiday. And if you recall that, you may also know that there was a certain amount of controversy about it. There were many people who didn't feel that Martin Luther King or the Civil Rights Movement deserved to be recognized with a national holiday. And I wish this were funny, but mostly it's just ironic. The most vehement objections to the national holiday for Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King came from the great state of Arizona. It was also the place, well, let me say this first. You two have been powerfully moved by the life of Martin Luther King. We just heard that last verse of in Pride in the Name of Love uh, about Martin Luther King. And uh, so Bono and the other members of the band campaigned for this holiday. And as a result of that, they got a lot of hate mail and at least one completely credible death threat from the great state of Arizona. Um, the FBI, anyway, considered it a credible death threat. And it was very simple. I kind of admire the simplicity of it. It said, don't come to Arizona. <laughs> and if you do come to Arizona, don't play pride in the name of love. Because if you do, I will blow Bono's head off. Now, you already know since I'm telling the story that they did go to Arizona. And so you probably also know that they did play pride in the name of love. And Bono tells this story often, and so I know it's one of his favorite stories as well. But he talks about when they came to that point in the Phoenix show where they were playing pride in the name of love. He says, I closed my eyes, and I just tried to live in the beauty of those lyrics and forget that someone had threatened to blow my head off. And then I don't know what compelled him to do this, but he says, and then I got to the third verse, the Martin Luther King verse. And he says, I opened my eyes. And when I did, I discovered that Adam was standing in front of me. Nothing was going to happen to Bono that didn't happen to Adam first. And Bono said, I knew then what it meant to be in a band. And we might say in an even more profound sense, he knew then what it meant to be in a faithful community. In the Gospel of John, Jesus leaves one commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. And Jesus also says in the Gospel of John that no greater love does somebody have than to give up his life for his friend. That's big love. Here's the last thing, though. Big love that stays just in our hearts or even in our faithful community is not enough. Augustine would tell us that, and you too <coughs> has modeled that. What Augustine said is, what, where there is great love, there is always great justice. Love doesn't just stay inside the walls of the faith community. It breaks out into the world and becomes a part of God's rescue mission. And we've seen that in the lives of you too as well. You know much of this, and so I'll just touch on a couple of things. But I love this because this is a nice quote from Bill Gates. Bill Gates said, a few years ago, I was sitting in a bar with Bono. <laughs> and frankly, I thought he was a little nuts. It was late, we'd had a few drinks, and Bono was all fired up over a scheme to get companies to help tackle global poverty and disease. He kept dialing the private numbers of top executives 
and thrusting his cell phone at me to hear their sleepy but enthusiastic replies. As crazy as it seemed that night, Bono's persistence soon gave birth to the Red Campaign. Today, companies like The Gap, Hallmark, and Dell sell Red branded products and donate a portion of those profits to fight AIDS. Microsoft signed up too. It's a great thing. The companies make a difference while adding to their bottom line. Consumers get to show their support for a good cause. And most important, lives are saved. In the past year and a half, Red generated $100 million for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS. Put nearly 80,000 people in poor countries on life-saving drugs and helped more than 1.6 million get tested for HIV. That is just one of the tiny little pieces of what U2 has done over the last 30 years. You know in their music, they have talked about peace and justice. Powerful songs like Sunday, Bloody Sunday, um, Miracle Drug, Walk On. Many of you noticed in November last year when the Burmese activist uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was finally released from house arrest where she had spent most of the last 15 years. The song Walk On is about Aung San Suu Kyi. And while Bono and the boys didn't claim credit for that, you probably know that on their last tour, uh, people attending concerts were invited to download and print out an Aung San Suu Kyi mask to put on at some point so that everybody could be in solidarity with her. The kind of visibility that they brought to her cause certainly did not hurt in the military government finally releasing her. We've heard stories about Bono in Ethiopia. A story for him and his understanding that he was called from his faith to do justice comes from a time early on in the life of U2 when he and his wife, Ali, were in a, a refugee camp in Ethiopia. And on the day before they departed, a father brought his infant son and put him in Bono's arms and begged him to take him back to Ireland. If he stays here in Ethiopia, the father said, he will die. If he goes with you, he will live. It's a pretty bracing lesson in the realities of poverty. And Bono says that that's where his journey toward justice began. And it hasn't let up. You know of other things. Uh, the Live Aid show, the Amnesty International tour that they did. Um, Bono's work as lobbyist for the poor, where he sits down with the Pope, with prime ministers, with presidents. And he says, I don't care their political persuasion. We all have core values. We can all work together. It's amazing. Jesse Helms, the ultra-conservative senator, became one of Bono's best friends. So here's the last thing that I want to leave you with. A couple of years ago, Bono was invited to speak to the Washington Prayer Breakfast. It's an amazing annual event uh, where the rich and powerful dress up and pray together. On this particular occasion, uh, past President Bush was there, senators, the Congress. And what Bono brought them that morning was a prophetic word. And uh, this is the last of the things that I want to tell you before I close. In his sermon for the National Prayer Breakfast, in front of all the rich and powerful, this is what he said. God may well be with us in our mansions on the hill. I hope so. But the one thing on which we can all agree among all faiths and ideologies is that God is with the vulnerable and the poor. God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. 
a powerful understanding. Much of it, by the way, as you may know, comes from uh, liberation theology. The idea that God loves the poor a lot because they need it. But here's the place where I want to close. We've talked about belief, we've talked about community, we've talked about justice. We've talked about these ideas of being on an ongoing journey together that calls us to be the best that we can be in community and to minister to the needs of those outside the walls of our community. Augustine said, where there's great love, there's great justice. But one of my favorite American authors, Willa Cather, said, where there is great love, there are always miracles. The lesson we might carry away from this is simply this, and it's a very Augustinian message. If we love God, if we love each other, if we walked together, what miracles might we see? Thanks very much for coming out on this rainy night. Such a joy to talk to you. God bless. minutes or so for, for questions, if people want to stick around for questions. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to take a couple of questions right? if somebody wanted to stay, and I know that you may have stuff that you need to do, but again, thank you for coming. Yeah, we okay. really appreciate uh, you bringing in St. Augustine to the, uh, to the talk, too, of course. Uh, does anybody have any questions for, for Dr. Garrett? Anybody? Questions? For requests for they can't be. They can't be trivia questions. Um, I was at a book signing event, and somebody came up to me and was like really huffy and said, where was Adam Clayton born? And I'm like, do I look like Wikipedia? <laughs> but he just like stomped off. It's like, if I didn't know where Adam Clayton was born, he wasn't going to buy my book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so don't ask me that, because I still don't know. Anybody? Questions? Yes, right here. Well, you know, it's got a couple of different resonances. Um, U-2 is the high-flying spy plane of the 1960s. So, you know, we might think of it like being up above the world and having a God's eye view. Um, but also when you say it slowly, U-2. You know, it's, it's an inclusive kind of gathering thing. Uh, and it was like their third name. So I don't know who came up with it. I'll bet Wikipedia does. But, um, yeah, I, I do think it's a name with some spiritual resonance. Anybody else? Are they coming to Philadelphia soon? I don't, I don't know. Um, they, they had pushed back dates, but um, what I'm hearing is July. <laughs> okay. And you're going to go. A year later, and you're going to go. So cool. Well, good. Y'all, thanks so much for coming. I hope that this will send you back to U2's catalog with some appreciation and maybe some new interest, and uh, that you'll listen to music maybe with a little bit more of a spiritual ear. Lots of blessings for us there. Thanks so much. Good night.